thought I might begin just maybe delving a little bit more into my vocation story. We'll start there. I'm going to hold myself to 10 minutes because I can talk for like hours because um, it's always so exciting for me, at least, to share the way the Lord has worked in my life, continues to work in my life, and I have hope and faith that we continue to do so on the future as long as He wills. So, um, as Kelly said, I'm from Minnesota. And now, uh, Minnetonka, Minnetonka, Minnesota. So, what's interesting though is we're all from Tennessee. My family's Anglo Tennesseans, Nashville, Chattanooga, and we were transplants to Minnesota. And um, I grew up there, and I had a wonderful childhood, raised Catholic. Um, whenever I talk about my vocation, I, it's really, you know, as I get older, and I'm sure you all are in the same boat, you realize the gift that your parents have. I mean, the impact, no parents are perfect. You know, it doesn't matter who they are. But you begin to see the great gift and the influence they have in, in your own life. And in my case, my parents, I'm just so grateful to them. Baptizing. I mean, we forget. Baptism is like the most important day of your life, right? The gates of the eternal life are open. But that alone, I, I tell parents, people who like have the first child and decide to get their baby baptized. Like, you just did the most important thing you will ever do for your child. And you just did it. But it's true. I mean, it's really true. Um, anyway, so I, I'm so grateful to my parents and, and just the virtue, you know, just the basic virtues. Ultimately, our Lord was able to use later on in my life. Um, because it, it wasn't until college, oh, I gotta push 10 minutes here, okay. Because it wasn't until, um, some tracks, uh, it wasn't until later, it wasn't until college. And I don't know what you, I, I'd say my supernatural vision was called, and, and sort of my outlook on life, my outlook on the world was challenged, and ultimately um, better, better in, in many ways than this. I'm so I'm in debt to many people um, for that. But yeah, before that I wanted to be a soccer player, and I wanted to be a rock star. If you had seen me in high school, you would not recognize me because I have long hair and all that, and I wanted to be the man, and that's guitarist. And it was a lot of fun. But at the end of the day, when I went to college, the thing that really shook me up, and I was looking forward to college, being away from home, you guys may be in the same situation, ready to make your own schedule, take life by the horns, we're going to go get it. Well, that was me, but I'll never forget when my parents walked out of that door. This is our grandma. Walked out of that door and the door closed. And it was just like this cloud of loneliness. Just, and you're like, I was like, all right, here it is. Go get it. You know, and it's terrifying. I was freaked out, and it took me by surprise. And what it was was loneliness. First time I was away from home in any serious way. And um, I didn't realize at the time that that, in my life, that is what the Lord used to break me out of my own little world. And that's what the world Lord used to open up my eyes. And, and, and it was a process. You know, people ask me, what was the moment? What was the moment? And it's tough for me to say it because it was, it was a slow process of people that I met who took an interest in me in my supernatural well-being, my soul, and they invested in me. The power of influence, I mean, the power of someone's life over another person's life. You know, when you, it's incredible. And, and I'm, my parents, and there's, there's others. So I went to college and, um, uh, oh man, okay. So many things. But anyway, I got involved at the USC Catholic Center, which is like the, the St. Paul's University. And for me, that served initially, definitely, initially, very much so, um, sort of that home away from home. And it offered me a, a network of activities, things to actually do, because when you're, when you're lonely, it's like, what am I going to do with my time? But also people, friendships, relationships I was able to nourish, um, 
that I still have to this day that I'm very grateful for. And so in many ways, it was my involvement there that began this process and started turning my heart, which now I can back and be very hard, very hard, and, and not willing to kind of let go of my plans and what I wanted to do, and it began to soften my heart. And so much of what I did at the Catholic Center was given my time and things like that. And as anybody knows who's involved in sort of a campus industry sort of situation, it's, there's all the tips on it. And you know they're always willing to say, yes, if you want to put yourself out there. And before you know it, you've got more than you can handle on your plate. And on the one hand, that's a blessing. But on the other hand, that can be somewhat of a distraction. And at a certain point in my sophomore year, that distraction was made evident. And I realized, you know, that loneliness, that like, it's still there. It's really not gone. And what was so confusing about it is I didn't know why. I thought I was doing all the right things. You know, I was going to the center. I was doing stuff. It was great. Doing well in school. But yet there was like that lingering. Just that loneliness. And um, providentially, thank the Lord, it was around that time. Began meeting with the priest for spiritual formation. There's a friend I met earlier, and, and whose friendship developed with time. He's one of those ones who took a real interest in my well-being, not just like professional being or how I'm doing in school, but also like how am I living in life, how am I corresponding to the graces the Lord's bestowing upon me, am I conforming my will with the Lord's will? You know, slowly, and in friendship, working with me, he introduces me to this priest. And that's really where things got excited, I like to say. And things really started to change. And um, it was through those meetings. And I love it, because he would come to USC. He actually lived near UCLA, which is like the Archie of the USC or Trojans. He would ask me to humble himself and drive over. He'd set up shop and he'd smell guys and meet them, but it was every other week. And what I discovered through that is what I was lacking was an interior. And we hear about this all the time, and my parents, who are awesome, talk to me about, you know, we need to pray. Talk about bedtime prayers. And we all do that. We have those habits that we've established. And you're so blessed to live here in Wisconsin, Madison be involved here at St. Paul's Catholic Center, where, where what I'm about to talk about is no surprise. The interior of life, the life of prayer. And how essential that is to our flourishing as human beings. To our being able to discern the will of God for our lives, and to discover the joy of our vocations, and then to act in trust and confidence. But for me, it wasn't common sense. It wasn't something that was being, you know, talked about incessantly. Even in the week I've been here, I love it. Father Eric, he's just like, he, he throws it in there every second he can, and he does it in such a awesome, which is such a natural way. You know, he just, he, just, he lives it. He lives it, and his witness is powerful for me. And that's one of the things I want to learn But this priest worked with me on that. He really didn't let me make excuses because it's so easy. I don't have time. You know, I've got so much to do. I've got to worry about my future. And these are all stresses we all want to worry about. But he didn't let me, he didn't let me do that. He didn't let me do that. He said, you know, I really believe that Jesus is who he is. Our Savior. When he died on the cross for each and every single one of us. Not to just rub it in our face, but that so we can develop a relationship with Him. To save us from sin, but also to save us for heaven, eternal joy, and union with the Holy Father. <coughs> right? It's like, if you really believe that, you can't spin it. Just talk it. To 
develop that relationship. And when you put it like that, you feel pretty stupid. You're like, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, Father Robbie. You put it like that. Um, you know, I do have time. But we all have time. That's the point. I say we all have time. And it took a while for me to learn that. But once this priest, God bless him, working with me, challenging me, and once I began to believe it, and to act accordingly, that's when life and it didn't begin with the priesthood. It didn't begin with the priesthood. You know, but it began with the universal call of holiness. And the fact that we're all called to be saints. And we're all called to uh, listen to the Lord, to be in love with the Lord, and to discover the plan that He has for our lives. Because He's got a plan for each and every one of us. That's what our vocation is. You know, that word vocation is sort of a little pet peeve of mine. It's sort of been hijacked. So when you hear the word vocation, you automatically think priesthood or like religious life. And while that's good because there's great need for those vocations, that's not the only kinds of, those aren't the only kinds of vocations. There's a variety of vocations. And one of the most beautiful vocations is that to family life. Is that to that husband or wife? God will love that father. Yeah, parents are awesome. Uh, vocation, you know, and the discovery of that vocation. That's what really opened up for me. And it didn't begin with priesthood, like I said, because I ended up being a girl and dating her. She was awesome. She was Catholic. I never had a Catholic girlfriend before. And, and, and as my faith was becoming more important to me, I was like, I what it's like to have a Catholic girlfriend. <laughs> But I hadn't really met uh, someone yet. And so I was kind of in this point of like uh, interest. Oh, that's the time. We're going to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to be safe, I'll put five minutes, but we'll probably keep going. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, yeah, God bless her. She's awesome. But she, um, yeah, so anyway, we had a wonderful relationship. And in many ways, we grew together. And it is such a gift. And once again, you guys, this is no surprise to you. You hear these things all the time. But what a gift it is to be able to share with somebody on the deep level of faith. To share your Catholic faith with somebody. And to let our Lord be the good that both of you are seeking for each other and in the relationship itself. That's, as you all know, too, that's very common these days. But it's possible. Right? Talking with young people, they get discouraged, especially who are like trying to live their faith. They get discouraged because they're like, they get out of college, and now they're kind of in the world. Like, Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Be absolutely concerned about uniting, about uniting yourself to our Lord. He will take care of it. It's like, you know, you go where true goodness, you go where true beauty, and you go where truth is, that's that's the Lord. That's the Eucharist. You go there, and the person kneeling beside you, that's the type of person you want to get. That's the type of person you want to get to know. And that's the type of person we need. Right? So there's no need to be discouraged. Or work, but trust in the Lord and it's in our problems. So, anyway, we had a great relationship. But at, and at a certain point, I was like, yeah, she's the one. And that's an exciting time. It's also going to be kind of special, too. You know, thinking of your plans and all that. Well, now I'm getting closer to graduation, job offers, when I'm going to work. Well, now I've got to decide now, but I don't want to, you know, do that stuff. All right. And uh, so that's kind of where I was at a certain point. And it was around that time, I remember one day in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. I'm not sure which I was going to wonder where. It was nighttime, it was kind of dark. Doing mental prayer, as Father Eric talks about, which is the best. Um, and I remember during that time, uh, not that it was a 
voice, but there was something that happened. And it was as though the idea, the possibility of the priest was to place on the table. You know, I had thoughts about the priesthood before this, before I met her. But in, that, in those moments, it was very much like a, man, if you want to do this, you got to go away. you got to step up to play as a man, you got to be a priest. <laughs> you know, if you really believe this stuff, you got to be a priest. You know, why would you suffer anything less? Because my whole notion of vocation is not, you know, it's just kind of child. Which is, we know that's not like the, that's not the best reason. Uh, <laughs> just macho man. That's not, that's not what our Lord desired. So this time was different. This time this was an invitation. This time it was our Lord engaging my freedom. And saying, look what you have, man. And that's good. But there's something else it's time to consider now. The priesthood. going straight to my spiritual director and being like, what do I do? <laughs> because, I don't know, I can tend to be a little emotional at times. And, and I was like, should I tell her? Should I not tell her? I don't want to blow it. At the same time, I don't want to blow anything out of proportion. He's like, chill out. This is why spiritual direction is such a gift. We all need spiritual They know you. They get to know you on the most intimate levels. And they can tell you, dude, chill out if you need to chill out. And they can say, step up to the plate if you need to step up to the plate. Anyway, he told me to chill. And he said, don't worry, just we're going to sit with this. And this lingers, maybe the Lord's trying to tell you something. You don't have to tell her yet. That time might come. Well, let's just see what God does with you. Well, anyway, that desire and that invitation became stronger. It's like, it's hard to put into words, but it's like a drawing in. There's an excitement. And there's kind of a mystery to and I remember, oh, that's the time we're again. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're going to Okay. Anyway. <laughs> um, there's a mission. And anyway, it grew and it deepened and it got to the point I had to tell her I could not tell her. You know, you can't be sharing your life with someone in that way. Open up and just start. Because it became clear this was more than just passing emotions. And so again, I'm sort of scared, but anyway, we had to have that talk. That was a hard talk. I remember sitting there for me. And uh, I'll keep her name anonymous. But I said, no, Jenny, um, her name's not Jenny. <laughs> you know, Jenny. I think, you know, this idea that she knew I was over the priest, but that it was like I sincerely thought we had a chance to make the Lord. So I said, you know, I think that the idea of the priesthood, I think the Lord has put it on the table in a more serious way. And you need to know that, although I'm not confident in making a decision, I'm like crunching as I'm saying it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> not blinking, cute as can be. And, uh, <laughs> and she says, this is awesome. This is why she's such a strong, holy woman. And she just looks at me and she says, without blinking an eye, without hesitating, she goes, man, you need to do what God wants you to do and don't worry about it. And I knew that was very difficult for her to say. And then there was silence. <laughs> <laughs> after that conversation, we had some more, we had some more, and they were much more emotional, but it got to the point where it was clear. It was clear that the time had come to break up with her. And it was very difficult, because my struggle was that I, I thought that if I broke up with her, I'd ruin her life. You know? And I think that's a temptation that can come straight from the devil, is that we put ourselves as the center of attention. And we put ourselves um, in the place of the ultimate good for the other. And it's really our Lord and His will. And 
what I didn't realize, but that I came to realize, was that, you know, if I truly believe that, then you've done it. That if the Lord was asking me to go down this path, He was. And I said no. Not only am I like not living in accord with what the Lord desires for me, which is scary enough to think about. And just sad. So many people cut themselves short. But um, also, I would actually be preventing her away from living out the Lord's will for her life. I'd be getting in the way of her actually corresponding with her vocation, which is even, to me, at the time, I was like, wow. And as much as I knew that intellectually, still, you know, and, uh, it's hard to act on things sometimes. It's hard to, like, have the courage to be able to do what you know you've got to do. But it came, and at a certain point, the Lord gave me the courage. And we had to have that conversation. We broke up. It was very difficult. Um, very difficult for both of us, especially her. And um, when I did it, Um, well, when I did it, I thought I made a mistake in my life. It was really confusing. And she didn't say anything. She just left. And I was like, oh, no. I am just messed up life. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and there's an to that. I mean, you're watching somebody's heartbreak. And that's never an easy thing. In many ways, your heart's breaking. Um, but as the emotion settled, the clarity was still there. And I had to follow through. And what it meant for us is that we just had to cut it off. We just had to cut it off completely. And we went our separate ways. I haven't spoken to her in almost five years. It's been about one and a half years. Yeah. What I did, oh. I guess um, maybe just pass it. Uh, 
So, um, so one of the joys of, of being in the seminary is that you get to meet a lot of cool people, a lot of interesting people. And one, of, one of the people I've met since going to the seminary is an economist from uh, a university near the seminary. I go to St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, which is just north of Los Angeles. So it's about an hour, 60 miles away, so depending on the traffic. Um, but he, so he teaches at Pepperdine, he's an economist, but he's a solid cat. And we met at like an evening of recollection once upon a time, and we kept in touch. So he's, he's an economist, that's like what he's saying, but he also has a deep connection to Catholic social teaching and Catholic social doctrine. And, you know, he's written about it, he's hoping to do more writing about it in the future. Um, and so tonight's sort of talk is kind of inspired by Dr. Andy Gunner. Uh, what do you call it? So he's kind of inspired by, by Andy and just the friendship we've had, just him just talking about you know, the church, but, you know, basically opportunities for the future and different things within uh, Catholic life and all that. And it's, so Catholic social teaching is something he's kind of talking about. And it's kind of interesting um, because at the same time we hear about it in the seminary as well. Uh, but what's kind of funny um, is that, you know, I guess I guess we hear about Catholic social teaching, but we don't really get into it all that much. And that's true of seminarians as well. Um, in a recent study of, or like poll of seminarians, they've you know, identified more or less that seminarians hear about Catholic social teaching in the classroom, but it's not all that common for Catholic social teaching to kind of get out of the classroom um, and integrate it into the other dimensions of formation. Because as seminarians, it's not just about classes and schoolwork, but it's about your spiritual life, it's about the life of virtue, it's about the meaning, uh, it's about the pastoral life, you know, conforming our hearts to the heart of Christ. And serving as Christ served, and living as Christ served. So, you know, uh, I thought it might be kind of cool just to get into it um, to a certain extent. I mean, it's so deep, it's so rich. There's a lot of um, uh, just good, good resources, and I hope to kind of talk a little bit about some of those um, for our own personal study and developing our interests. Um, and, and basically, Catholic social teaching stems from the fact that the Christian life has a social dimension to it. And when you look at the life of Jesus, you see that. Um, you know, in addition to uh, caring for souls and forgiving sins and feeding us with himself in the Holy Eucharist and nourishing us truly, um, with his very being. We also see he paid great attention to uh, the material needs of people. And it's always good to remind ourselves, you know, walking through the life of Jesus, just, you know, in your own mind. Uh, one of my favorite saints talks about that. You know, we ought to be familiar with Jesus' life, that it can kind of play in our minds. You know, you've got the Annunciation. Visit to Elizabeth. You got him fleeing to Egypt, right? The Holy Family. You know, leaving their homeland. Probably the loneliness and the scary, how scary that was. You've got Jesus growing in age and wisdom and favor before God and man. He's growing. The true God and true man developing. He was in the workshop with Joseph. Learning the dignity of work. You know, learning to work hard. You know, he's at the wedding feast. Paying tribute to the beauty of marriage. You know, his public ministry begins. And immediately he's preaching. I think we forget. I mean, you know, there's a cool, um, it's prior to Revelation, although she's blessed. Um, Catherine and Emmerich. Uh, talking about the life of our Lord, and one of the things that struck me is she, in her uh, 
the prior relationship. He was like, Jesus was teaching all the time. Like we have we have a snapshot of Gospels. He was teaching all the time. He was just engaged all the time. So we see him teaching, educating, right? And we see Jesus eating the hungry. We see Jesus. Um, Uh, feeding the hungry, uh, forgiving sins. He's. Uh, what else did Jesus do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to look at the notes. He's, uh, he's calling out. Yeah, he's calling the dead. Calling out the hypocrites. You know, he's chastising them. He's, he's, he's engaging rich people, encouraging them to get out of Riches, because otherwise you're not going to be able to enter into a sort of relationship I'm asking of you. You know, he's teaching his apostles what it means to be a friend, what it means to be a true friend, and how, what it means to serve. Right? So, basically, the point is there's a dimension of the Christian life that's social. The teaching of the faith is there's a social dimension to it. And we have the example of Christ right before us. And what is so, yeah, I think powerful about it is you just look at Jesus and wearing a lens. Look at Christ. I mean, Christ himself took on these situations that our social teaching is going to delve into. I mean, absolute poverty on the cross. Naked on the cross. You can bet he was hungry on the cross. You can bet he was thirsty. He tells us I thirst. He was thirsty on the cross. You know, a criminal on the cross. Right? Uh, so, I mean, Jesus, it's like his example is right there. Yet in addition to that, we have the church. And the way that, that through Christ's pastoral ministry, guiding the Holy Spirit, we've learned more about the Christian life and what it means to be a Christian, what it means to live like a Christian. And um, one of the central teachings from the get-go, implication of the incarnation, Jesus becomes true God and true man, is the emphasis of the church on human dignity. The dignity of the human person. This is like, in Catholic social teaching, this is like the, I don't know, I don't know but it's like the foundation. <laughs> it's going to take too much time. I don't know. I don't have all night. Um, but the dignity of the human person, right? So, that's a constant, obviously, throughout our church. And in recent times, this is proclaimed been proclaimed even more from the roots of house top, rooftops than it has been for our whole century. And one of the people we have to thank for that is St. John Paul II. St. John Paul II has really articulated clearly the fact that each and every single human being has dignity that cannot be taken away, that cannot be judged, that cannot be qualified by virtue of who we are as human persons. Right? If you look at like his early writings, Love and Responsibility, which I bet Father Eric gives you at least talked about. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but he begins that book, which is primarily on relationships, especially the sorts of relationships that uh, happen between members of the opposite sex and then women. But he begins that book by the dignity of the human person. And whatever I'm going to say about relationships begins with the dignity of the human person. Right? And then he moves into the social, and then he moves into the marital. Right? And then that, but it's important, that's not just like the ideas of John Paul II. I mean, this is going to be reiterated in the Second Vatican Council. In particular, in the document, God even specs. And who was, who was like in charge with the writing of that document? In conjunction with other cardinals in the division. <laughs> None other than. Now, this is like the most authoritative, like, I mean, the council is like the most authoritative writing in a long time, up to date. And in God even sped, what, what, what's the pattern once again? The dignity of the human person. That's where it begins. And then it moves from there into the social and in the more particulars of society. And then, so that's like the early 60s. And then JP2 is elected Pope, right? Well, guess what his first encyclical is on? Redemptor hominis, the redeemer of man. He's once again powerhousing just 
totally articulating the fact human dignity. He's saying this human dignity is coming from Jesus Christ. And our redemption is Jesus. I might read a little bit of that. Um, the, from Guiding His Best, number 22, paragraph 22. The truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on life. For Adam, the first man, was a figure of him who was to come, namely Christ the Lord. Christ the final Adam by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love fully reveals man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear. It is not surprising that in him, this capital H, Jesus, all the aforementioned truths find their root and attain their crown. And then he goes on just talking about the dignity of man coming from the incarnation, coming from Jesus, assuming a human nature. So the dignity of the human person, and that is what is going to be proclaimed by the church at the turn of the century, in the late 1800s, or late 19th century. Because what's happening? Society is changing in such a way that the dignity of man that the church has always proclaimed is being threatened. It's being threatened um, because sort of the societal structures, societal structures of society are changing. <laughs> so, society is changing economically. The way we organize ourselves, organization, for example. Different ideas about the family are coming into play. And the role of men and women within the family are coming into play. Right? And the church is seeing that what is going on in society is actually can be very opportune to harmonize <coughs> with the human with the human dignity that each and every single person has, but then also it can be a great threat. To that human day, if we aren't careful. And so the church begins to speak, and that begins in the late 1800s, 1891. Generally, Catholic social doctrine begins with the encyclical Rerum Novarum by Pope Leo XIII in 1981. And then it's followed by a whole host of encyclicals by every Holy Father after. I'm just going to read a couple just so we get them in our mind, but this isn't all of them. Quadra Jesse Moano. By Pope Pius XI in 1931, Mater et Magistra by Saint John, Pope Saint John XXIII in 1961, Pope Leon Progressio by Blessed Pope Paul VI, Octogesimae Adminians, Novo by Paul VI, Laborum Exertions, Exertions, JP II, um, Sanctissimus Sanctus for JP II, Veritas of Splendor, JP II, Evangelium Vitae, JP II, Caritatis and uh, Veritate by Pope Benedict. Pope Francis obviously is taking this up. Um, Lumen Fide discusses it, that's an encyclical as well. But these are all up on the level of like encyclical papal teaching. Uh, and I'm sure he'll speak even more. And I imagine it'll come up in his next encyclical, which is on the environment. So anyway, I, I do want to read just a little bit from some of these encyclicals because it's, it's, these documents are really beautiful, and I know I myself do not spend enough time. Uh, it's so easy in our day to read secondhand sources, and that's good, we should. There's a lot of great commentaries. But sometimes it's nice to just kind of go back to, you know, the source every now and then. So, Mater et Magistra, Mother and Teacher, let's talk about the church. This is Saint John the 23rd. In the first, first line of the second paragraph, Christianity is the meeting, meeting point of heaven and earth. Like that in and of itself, you can meditate upon it. It's just like Christianity is the meeting point of heaven and earth. Though the church's first care must be for souls, she concerns herself too with the exigencies of man's daily life, with his livelihood and education, and his general temporal welfare and prosperity. When he said, as Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the light of the world, it was doubtless man's eternal salvation that was uppermost in his mind. But he showed his concern for the material welfare of his people. When seeing the hungry crowd of his followers, he was moved to exclaim, I have compassion on the multitude. Small wonder then that the 
Catholic Church in imitation of Christ and in fulfillment of his commandment relies not merely upon her teaching to hold aloft the torch of charity, but also upon her wise, all her widespread example. It is a charity which combines the precepts and practice of mutual love. So he's giving us an order in the hierarchy. The eternal salvation of souls, that's what the church is about. And uh, one of the canons, I wrote it down to you because we're learning this in canon law in the seminary. <laughs> Shout out to Monsignor Zach. Um, just kidding. Uh, in canon 1752, it, it clearly articulates. This is the last canon. It's like, hey, everything that was just said ought to be ordered in accordance with the salvation of souls, which must always be the supreme law of the church and is always to be kept before our eyes. In Latin, supreme elect salus animal. Supreme elect salus. The supreme law of the church is the salvation of souls. We can't forget about that. But the point is that social doctrine is coming into that. It's a way in which we actually care for the eternal salvation of our brothers and sisters around the world. Um, um, so we got Kim Law behind this. And then you got Pope Benedict. I, I figured out she was Pope Benedict as well. Caritas and Veritate. Uh, I'd like to read more from it. But it says, Charity and truth, to which Jesus Christ bore witness in his earthly life, and especially by his death and resurrection, is the principal driving force behind the authentic development of every person and of all humanity. Love is an extraordinary force which leads people to opt for courageous and generous engagement in the field of justice and peace. It is a force that has its origin in God, eternal love, absolute truth. Charity is at the heart of this church's social doctrine. It goes on to just lay it out. Typical Benedictine, uh, Pope Benedict fashion. B-16 bomber fashion, they, they say. <laughs> Which, I <agree> <laughs> Which I agree with. Which I agree with. So charity, you know, this is, we begin with our Lord. We begin with God. We're talking about man and man's dignity and we're moving to making sure that we always respect that. That is really our God. Love is our God as we engage the society, the dangers um, that man faces. So some of these principles. So basically, Catholic social doctrine, um, the church, in her articulation of the social doctrine of the church, um, articulates and talks about principles. They're sort of, and these are being drawn from the documents, right? These are being drawn from the encyclical the teachings of the Holy Father. Fathers. And some of these principles are the dignity of the human person, right? That's like the found, that's the, it says that's, that's the foundation. The common good, so like the common good is going to be discussed as a part of this teaching of the church. What is the common good all about? What do we say common good? Well, what's the good of each individual person? And how does the good of each individual person interplay with the common good of society? How that we begin to relate to each other and interact with each other uh, on a societal level. Um, it's going to break that down and talk about things like the universal destination of goods. You know, there's an interesting situation in many parts of the world, but one, um, there's a slum there called uh, Kybera. And one of the interesting issues is precisely around this issue of universal destination of goods, the idea that creation is intended for everybody, it's universal, it's supposed to be for all. Yet in this particular slum, it's kind of a practical example, people um, are being denied private property. So the idea that property, the land, is creating an aspect of creation is intended for all. Yet, most of that land is in the hands of few, and in the land that some of the poorest of the poor have, it's not recognized in any legal sense as private property. They have no claim to this land. These are not idiots. These are people who would love to start a business. These are people who would love to be able, right? 
but let's just take the example of starting a business, it's very difficult because they can't, they can't have a title to buy that land. They can't get a loan that's based upon their ownership of that land. It's collateral, for example, for money that they get in order to start a business they want to start. Um, and then even if they did, you know, laws aren't even enforced there, so who's to stop somebody else from coming in and taking it from them? It goes back to the Seventh Commandment. Um, so the universal destination, that's another thing that's going to be talked about. Creation is we, our globalization, how, we, how do we reconcile that? Private property, prefer, preferential options for the poor, subsidiarity. So this is, this is kind of a, a nice book. It's really not known very well. We hear a lot about the catechism, as we should have. <laughs> Which is a great, well spent truth. But there's also the compendium of social doctrine of the church, which I recommend. If you haven't heard of it, it's really, it's not difficult to read, but it's, it's all solid. And it's, it's put out by um, Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. Don't get it frightened by the sign. But <laughs> it's just kind of fun to make sure. <laughs> The index is this <laughs> But it hashes out all, a lot of these things. That, you know, I can't go into it all right now, but I would encourage, you know, this would be cool. And it's beautiful. Like, it's just, yeah, the church is beautiful. Um, but anyway, it talks about subsidiarity um, and what that means. And then, the, you know, essentially articulating that things ought to be done on the lowest level of bureaucracy, you might say. Because they can. They should. And that the, one of the roles of government is to actually foster that. Because there's a dignity in that when people are engaged and, and doing, working, and contributing. And then there's like a actually a, a obligation that is tacked onto there to participate. Like not only do we have a right to that subsidiary relationship, but then we have an obligation to actually participate. You know, to actually get engaged and to work and, and to do things. There's another principle, solidarity. You know, which recognizes essentially the equal rights of all. The equality that each of us has in dignity is human by virtue of our being human being. And, and letting that, you know, fuel our commitment for the common good. The rights of all as human beings, solidarity. You know, do we have a commitment to our brothers and sisters in upholding our rights and their dignity? Um, Pope Benedict and in his last uh, encyclical, Caritas and Veritate, paragraph 9, so, so says, and so there's principles that the church is proclaiming loudly and clearly. But he says, the church does not have technical solutions to offer and does not claim to interfere in a way with the politics of states. She does, however, have a mission of truth to accomplish in every time and circumstance for a society that is attuned to man to his dignity, to his vocation. Without truth, it is easy to fall into an empiricist and skeptical view of life, inescapable of rising to the level of praxis because of a lack of interest in grasping the values, sometimes even the means of which to judge and direct it. So he's saying that the church is proclaiming these principles, yet the church is not trying to become the state, for example. It's not trying to, you know, it respects the autonomy of government in, within society. And it holds the government to a high standard, as it should. But it's speaking on the level of principles. Um, and a follow-up point to the principles is the application of these principles. So we have principles, teachings of the church that are beautifully articulated in here on a deeper level, which you can Oh, yes. Yep. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, but then they got to be applied. And I just want to, this is kind of what I, this is kind of the point. This is kind of what I wanted to, like, delve a little bit more. This is like what Andy kind of talked to me a little bit more about, kind of challenged me on, and just kind of opened my eyes up to a little bit more. But if you go to the catechism here, paragraph, I think this is not here. 
It is not the role of the pastors of the church to intervene directly in the political structuring and organization of social life. <coughs> this task is the part of the vocation of the lay faithful, acting on their own initiative with their fellow citizens. Social action can assume various concrete forms. It should always have the common good in view and be in conformity with the message of the gospel and the teaching of the church, which implies Catholic social teaching. It is the role of the laity to animate the temporal realities with Christian commitment, by which they show that they are witnesses and agents of peace and justice. If you go to Canon 225, Read since, like all Christian faithful lay persons are designated by God for the apostolate through baptism and confirmation. They are bound by the general obligation and possess the right as individuals or joined in associations to work so that the divine message of salvation is made known and accepted by the persons everywhere in the world. This obligation is more compelling in those circumstances in which only through them can people hear the gospel and know Christ. According to each one's own condition, they are also bound by a particular duty to imbue the perfect and order of temporal affairs with the spirit of the gospel, and thus to give witness to Christ, especially in carrying out these same affairs and exercising secular functions. The point is, is that there's a great opportunity that the lay faithful have. I'm willing to do so. God, God willing, you know, I, I have this I'm willing not forever. But that there's a particular opportunity with the lay vocation to apply these principles in ways the pastors of the church, the shepherds of the church, cannot. And in many ways, I would say should not. And I think there's confusion around this at times. You know, um, Sometimes I think, you know, it's easy for, not necessarily you guys, you know, necessarily, but for a lot of people in your typical parish to say, well, yeah, but all this sort of work, all this sort of social justice stuff, that's for, like, the church to do. And they forget that as members of the church, they are a part of the church when it speaks of the church, speaks about the church. But anyway, that's more for, like, the church to do. It's not really, but, you know, this is saying actually just the exact opposite is there's a particular opportunity because it's the lay people who are actually already there. They're already where they need to be to exercise these principles in the concrete situations that they're experts in. That they could do a better job than the church even if the, the shepherd or the pastor of the church even if they tried. Because they're already there. That's the beauty of the lay vocation. So, um, there's a distinction between the principles which are proclaimed by the teaching authority of those shepherds. The bishops have the authority, the teaching authority of the church, which is awesome. And we're very grateful for that because where would we be without it? But then that's distinct from the application of those principles in which the prudential judgment in each and every single layman or woman is to apply those principles in concrete situations. That's why Pope Benedict says, you know, the church, forget what exactly he said. He said, um, uh, basically the church isn't there to intervene in the government. Oh, I don't know where it is. Oh, the church does not have technical solutions to offer. It does not claim to interfere in, you know, but that doesn't mean the Catholics don't go there. Laymen and women don't go there to proclaim the truth. And that's actually a responsibility that, that each has. Now, I'm not saying like you know, bishops shouldn't speak out about certain things. I think there needs to be a certain discretion because I think one of the problems is, is that sometimes we look for an excuse not to have to get involved. And so sometimes uh, I'm sure it's an unintended effect of some bishops or even priests who like do it all Maybe don't really empower anyone else to take part in it. They're basically uh, communicating and spoken message. This is what I do and you don't do. That. And then people, it's not always their fault, they, they won't take up the call. And so there's a beautiful opportunity here for each and every single one of us 
And that's where prudence comes in. There's a definition of prudence on the sheet from the catechism. Let's just Google it again. Um, to kind of guide what, what is prudence and then how you know, am I called to be prudent? It's one of the virtues, cardinal virtues there. Um, in concrete situations, I can make decisions right here and now. Because the principles don't always address that. And so there's a great day to the action of the lay vocation because you're given, you're actually being called to make those decisions in Portland um, Okay, real quick. Um, because we're in Wisconsin, I thought I might just bring up the example in passing. You guys probably remember a couple years ago, Paul Ryan with his whole like budget proposal and everything. That kind of blew up a little bit. People thought he was not in accord with the social teaching, and the Bishop Orlino speaks out and basically says, you know, it seems like he's he's trying to engage this in a serious way. And my point is not, you know, regardless of what you think about the actual budget, I mean there are letters written against him, places like Georgetown University, he's gonna write a letter, you know, and sign it, and, you know, call him a heretic or just like <laughs> With all, with all due respect, because actually I think those are discussions we actually need to have. But we need to be engaging in them honestly. So, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of it. But the point is, is that, in my mind, that's an example of someone who's trying to take seriously and then apply. And, and it's, it's up to somebody else to say, no, I think you're wrong, here's a better idea. And we need a lot more of that. We need a lot more of the engagement to even think on the level of Catholic social teaching. It's so uncommon, you know, so it's, it's such a breath of fresh air. Anyway, that's um, would be kind of cool. But here we are as grad students, young professionals. I remember in college, I was a business, I just majored in accounting. And you take like business exit ethics classes. And basically that turns into a big class on like corporate responsibility, which is good. But at the end of the day, decisions about corporate responsibility, those are CEO questions. That's not like a Matt Wheeler first year auditor you know, <laughs> question. I'll probably feel some pressure to like go along with it, even if I, whatever, think it's not that great. But that's CEO question. But like, how do you break this down? Because I, I think it can be helpful. Um, you know, Pope Benedict in that same encyclical says, you know, these principles apply in our lives, like our personal situations, as well as in the larger societal situations. And so, you know, just a couple things for thought. Principle like solidarity. Well, first off, you know, actually I should say, the church sees um, Catholic social teaching is a huge opportunity for evangelization. And a huge opportunity for proclaiming the gospel. I'll just read a little fast here. The church is JP2. It isn't so cool, so the church's social teaching is itself a valid instrument of evangelization. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, what I'm about to say is actually eye-opening, if you let it be, um, regarding the ways in which, as laymen and women, we can let living these principles actually bring people closer to Jesus, actually help share the joy of the gospel, actually help them on their way to corresponding with the Lord's will for their life. So for example, take a principle like solidarity, dignity of each and every single You know, like, what is our solidarity like with like our, our, our masters or PC program cohort? You know, that, that can be like a really competitive and a really sort of cutthroat environment to be in. And so as, as Catholics, like how do we foster and recognize the dignity of each person that we're involved with? Um, in a way, how do we support each other? Do we seek unity? What about our families? You know, as I get older, you know, problems with siblings of mine become more serious. And it's a beautiful thing to see, actually, members of my family come together in support of that person. And you kind of, and, and you know, how? So, like, each of us can ask ourselves, you know, do I do that? Am I even thinking on that level of solidarity within my family, within my school? Um, that ties in my preferential option for the poor. You know, what about that 
that person who's weak in your cohort, for example. That person who is struggling and needs help. Do we, do we just look at that's their problem or do we actually go out of ourselves and say, how can I help him succeed or her succeed? Um, this is something Pope Francis recently talked about in his Lenten address. Um, he calls it the globalization of indifference. Is that as this world gets more globalized, it's easier and easier just to ignore the fact that there is dignity in each of us has. And then it's even easier to ignore the fact that we need to be seeking unity with that and fostering that amongst ourselves. Um, not just in our, in, our, in our small situations, although that is, that is necessary, but also in the world. He says it's a problem Christians need to confront. Um, you know, participation, kind of that, that corollary of subsidiarity. Like, am I lazy? Like, do I work as well as I could? Do I, like, give my all? You know, or do I just take it for granted? You know, those, those sorts of questions. Um, to kind of bring it down on that sort of personal level. Because I, I think if we can't live it on that personal level, it's going to be very difficult to even, even really uh, persevere on, on the larger social level. And in many ways, we're, we're not going to really understand if we're not like, living it ourselves and here now in the situation we find ourselves. So it's kind of beautiful to reflect on. All right, final thing. Final thing. I just want to end with another uh, B-16 bomb right here. <laughs> it just puts it in the big picture. And I think that's something people may need to say. Um, so here it is. And I think this is, like, this is the last one. Charity is love received and given. It is grace. Its source is the wellspring of the Father's love for the Son and the Holy Spirit. Love comes down to us from the Son. It is creative love, through which we have our being. It is redemptive love, through which we are recreated. Love is revealed and made present by Christ and poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. You see what he's doing? He's moving the Blessed Trinity right down to us, being incorporated in the life of the Blessed Trinity through the power of the Holy Spirit. As objects of God's love, men and women become subjects of charity. They are called to make themselves instruments of grace. So as to pour forth God's charity into weaving networks of charity. This dynamic of charity received and given is what gives rise to the church's social teaching, which is caritas in veritate in re sociale. Sociale, the proclamation of the truth of Christ's love in society. It's beyond politics. It's beyond. It's about love. It's about Christ's love. Thank you.